please take your seats. And uh, Alison Dennis is going to come and she's going to read for us uh, from Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. Thanks. begged him on his knees if you are willing you can make me clean Jesus was indignant he reached out his hand and touched the man I am willing he said be clean immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning see that you don't tell this to anyone but go Show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. Amen. Alison, that was so beautifully read and such a long passage. Forgive me for giving you such a, a long passage this morning, but... You read it beautifully. Fantastic. So this is our fourth session uh, in our series entitled Read, Mark, Learn. And we're looking at 
Mark's gospel. Uh, Mark, as I've told you before, it's the first of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, to have been written. And because Mark was a very crude, um, short, pacey gospel, it was overlooked in preference for the later gospels, Matthew and Luke and John. They're far bigger and they're, they're written uh, with a better structure. Uh, they're polished. And Mark was kind of the bad boy of the four of them. In fact, it was not until the sixth century that the first commentary was ever written about Mark's gospel. That's how prominent it was as a gospel compared to the other three, Matthew, Luke, and John. What is fascinating is that back end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, um, Mark's gospel is the most popular in, uh, in academia. There is more study going on at the moment around the gospel of Mark than there is for the other three gospels. So it's, it's, uh, it's apt that we should be looking at this, this fascinating little gospel. Now remember, I've told you, and I will keep repeating to you, particularly up to chapter 8, uh, it's really important for us to keep an ear out for what people have to say about Jesus, who they think Jesus is. It's one of the things that Mark is really pushing as he writes this gospel. He keeps making comments about the reactions of others towards Jesus. What do you think of Jesus this morning? Do you see him as just a good moral teacher, a figure of history, a miracle worker, or the Son of God and the Savior of the world? That's where Mark wants to get his readers to. He wants them to acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So time and again, we get these comments from Mark over what folks think. So, so far... Mark's begun his gospel by declaring that Jesus is the messianic saviour, the son of God. So there's no doubt where Mark is coming from. We've next got the prophetical voice of scripture. Isaiah chapter 40, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. John the Baptist one more powerful than me is his comment. The voice of God from heaven. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The disciples, the first four who are called, their actions perhaps speak louder than their words. So Peter and Andrew, James and John, Jesus says to them, follow me, and immediately they leave their nets and they follow. What was it that attracted them to leave their livelihoods and follow Jesus? Now, we didn't have time last Sunday morning to look at an account that I hoped we'd get to. My, my time just ran away from me. The, the account of the possessed man in the synagogue at Capernaum who receives deliverance from Jesus. But I just want to highlight to you again a couple of comments that are made about Jesus in this episode. So the evil spirit who is possessing the man when Jesus encounters the evil spirit, he says... I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So you see all these pieces that are joining together and, and 
painting for us a portrait of who even the evil spirit acknowledges the Holy One of God. And then having delivered the man from his possession, notice the response of the congregation in verse 27. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. I am sure news about him spread quickly. So it's clear as we come out of chapter 1 and we launch into chapter 2, it's clear that Jesus is building a reputation for himself. The news about him is spreading like wildfire and we see this in the ensuing verses. He's still in the process of building his team. So far, he's only called four, two sets of brothers. So in the next sections that we're looking at, we've got clear accounts of the popularity of Jesus growing and individuals being added to the team. What an incredible invitation. Follow me. You know, we, we look back over the corridor of, of history. We, we have some idea who it is who calls into our hearts and lives, calls us to follow. We look at the crucified Christ. We look at the risen Jesus. We look at the transformational power that Jesus has had in the lives of men, women, and children throughout you know, history. These disciples who are called and follow, it's just, uh, it's just all new to them. And we have been called by the Savior of the world. Oh Lord, hear my prayer. It is the Lord Jesus who hears our prayer. Is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Scripture says. You glad to be a Christian this morning? Does the grace of God melt your heart? God's undeserved favor? I mean, who are you following? Who, who, who are you? Wh where, where is your life going? What road are you traveling down? We're all following something or someone, even if it's just ourselves. Fame, fortune, wealth, popularity, prestige in the workplace. How many folks have I known who've lived for prestige in the workplace, given their last moments? And they retire and they're forgotten. <laughs> They've built a life wanting to have prestige in the workplace. And they clear their desk and nobody contacts them. <laughs> It's a pipe dream. It's a smoke dream. Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Who are you following? Jesus says, follow me. In verse 29, Jesus and his small band of followers, <coughs> they go to the home of Simon and Andrew, where we're told that Simon's mother-in-law is in bed with a fever, verse 30. And they inform Jesus of this. And it's interesting, isn't it? Why do they tell Jesus? Do they tell him because they want him to be quiet in the house? Can you just be quiet? Because my mother-in-law, she's not very well. So we need just to be quiet. You know, we say things like that in our house. Can you be quiet? It's It's... It's 10.45 in the morning, and Carrie is still in bed. <laughs> Can you just keep the noise down? Is that why they're... Or do they tell Jesus in the hope that he might do something about it? They go to the home of Simon and Andrew, and Simon tells Jesus that my mum-in-law is ill with a fever in bed. Is it just information? 
or is it a hopeful request? Well, Jesus does appear to heal her. He doesn't mention that he heals her. He tells us a lovely little detail. I love Mark for his lovely little details. Tells, her, tells us that he took her by the hand. Isn't that a nice picture? To be taken by the hand. And the inference in that is that by taking her, he brought healing to her, and she gets up and she waits on Jesus and the others who are there. And then in verses 32 to 40, 34, people are bringing family and friends to Jesus for healing, both physical and spiritual. Now, you see, Mark is building a pace here. We've got these healing events, one after another. Boom, boom, boom. I tell you, he's pacey. And here he is. He's flooding our minds with these healing occasions. Can you picture the crowd outside? In fact, the next two encounters that... Jesus has with individuals involve healing. So uh, mom-in-law, that's one. The people are bringing family and friends, that's another. But then he goes and he prays in a solitary place, and we're not going to look at that this morning because we don't have time. We'll pick his prayer life up later on in the gospel. But then there's two more healing encounters the man with leprosy, verse 40 to 45, and the paralyzed man whose believing friends lower him through the roof in order to jump the queue effectively. Are you a queue jumper? This is, this, is, you know, this is an ingenious way of jumping a queue, isn't it? Take the roof tiles off. Lower the bloke straight down. This is better than private health insurance, this. Approximately 31% of Mark's gospel is devoted to the healing miracles of Jesus. Just over a third of Mark's gospel contains stories about the healing miracles of Jesus. So I want this morning, for the sake of the rest of our study of this gospel, I want to say a few things this morning about healing in the hope that we might have a balanced and a biblical approach to this complex and complicated subject of healing. Okay, yeah? So the first thing I want to say is this. The great truth is that God does heal today. Period. God does heal today. I believe that. I have seen that. Elsewhere and within the context of my ministry here at Reisler Baptist Church. God does heal today. The reality, however, not everyone is physically healed. And I have seen that here. And the reality of that has broken me here again and again and again. Because it's a mystery as to why God might intervene in one situation and choose not to intervene in another. And that's why we need to get our heads around having a, a biblical and a balanced understanding of the whole issue of healing within the context of Scripture and how that is worked at pastorally within the context 
of the church community. God does heal, but not everyone is healed physically. And that is biblically attested. We're told that Paul left Trophimus sick in Miletus. 2 Timothy 4.10. Paul leaves this Christian brother, Trophimus, and he's got to leave him behind because he's sick. Hang on a minute, who did I say I left him? Paul. The great apostle, Paul. The wonder-working apostle. Surely, you know, Paul could have done something to whiz-bang, twist the arm of God, get his mate healed. If anybody's going to call down healing from heaven, surely it's the great apostle but he has to write and say, I had to leave him back. I had to leave him behind. He was desperate to come, but he was sick. Hear that, my friends, this morning. Left Trophimus sick in my leaders. Paul himself appears to have had an ongoing physical ailment, which he refers to as his thorn in the flesh. There are some commentators who, not tongue-in-cheek, who believe he might be referring to his wife when he speaks about his thorn in the flesh. I don't go with it at all. I think it's totally nonsensical. The fact that it's a thorn in his flesh seems to imply he is struggling with some physical ailment. And he says, I pray to the Lord. And I've received no healing. And what did God say to me? My grace is sufficient for you. No healing, just the grace of God to cope within the situation. Even the passage that we've had beautifully read for us this morning from Mark, where folks were bringing for Jesus to perform miraculous cures, we're told in verse 34, Jesus healed many. Doesn't say Jesus healed many them all. John chapter 5, the pool at Bethsaida, where folks were placed every day because it was believed that when the waters moved, an angel was hovering over the pool and you could be healed. So every day, folks would bring their family members and they'd lay them by the pool in the hope that it might be their day. And Jesus turns up. <coughs> John 5 tells us of one healing. Now you can speculate, oh, you would have done more than one. Never argue from silence. Okay? Never build an argument from silence. It doesn't say that. It just tells us about one healing and the, the rest are left for whatever reason. So how can we encourage good pastoral practice as we seek to have a balanced and biblical understanding uh, about this subject of healing? Well, I'm going to leave you with a few thoughts uh, very quickly this morning. The first thing is this, we need to affirm the fact that God can and does still heal today. Let's, let's affirm that. Do you know one of the reasons why healings feature so much in Mark, a third, they're there to support his contention that the kingdom has come. And these miraculous signs are evidences that the kingdom has come. Something new is breaking in. 
This doesn't normally happen. And Mark uses them to build his argument that King Jesus has come. So the healing miracles signpost that the kingdom has been inaugurated through Jesus. But healing continues outside of the Gospels in the early church. Remember Peter and John on their way to the temple in Acts chapter 3? Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give you. In the name of Jesus, he says to the paralytic, arise, walk. And although at times the healing ministry of the church has been lost, it's still clearly witnessed through the centuries. Folks like St. Francis of Assisi, Martin Luther, John Wesley, the Moravians, the Pentecostal church. Some of you may have a, a background in Pentecostalism. I worshipped in a Pentecostal church when I was a teenager. It wasn't a service if we didn't have a healing prayer time. And folks got healed. The charismatic renewal mo movement of our day. Healing features. But sometimes the church's corruption, its lack of spirituality, has compromised its healing ministry. There's a very poignant story told about Pope Innocent II. He was counting a large pile of money when Thomas Aquinas, the Dominican priest, visited him. And Pope Innocent said to him, you see, Thomas, the church can no longer say silver and gold have I none, as he counts the cash. To which Thomas Aquinas replied, True, Holy Father, neither can she now say, Rise up and walk. So we need to affirm the second thing I want to say is, faith is a factor, but not a prerequisite for healing. So Jesus, Jesus clearly healed people in response to their faith. We see that in the Gospels. But he equally healed those who had little or no faith. So in the passage again that uh, Alison read for us, the leper has no doubt that Jesus can heal him. Verse 40, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. If you are willing. I know you can. I know you can. And Jesus responds to his faith. But in Mark 9... There's another incident when a father asks Jesus to heal his son, but his faith appears to be somewhat lacking. And he responds to Jesus by saying, I do believe, but help my unbelief. I know you feel like that sometimes. I know that God can do it, but I'm just not sure. You know in those kind of prayers? I do believe, but... <laughs> Help, help the parts of me that I'm just not sure. We, some, we, we see something of the impact of the faith of others exercised in that little incident, again, that Alison read for us about the guys who lower their friend down through the roof in chapter 2. And when Jesus sees this, what does he say? When Jesus saw their faith, he responds, I've known over the years in pastoral ministry, they, these folks do my head in with capital letters for do my head in right the way across. So when you don't receive healing, these folks will tell you it's due to a lack of your faith. It's a due to a lack of faith. And it's usually your faith that's lacking, not their faith that's lacking. It's your faith. 
You didn't get the healing because you didn't have faith. Which has always puzzled me. Because if they have the faith, why doesn't it supersede the lack of my faith? You know, I want to take them with me on a hospital trip. You never see a healing ministry team, you know, waiting for ambulances to arrive at hospital. And I've got the faith to believe that any and every one. When it doesn't happen, they, they, they point the finger. They say, it's because you've got no faith. A load of rubbish. It's a load of rubbish. Sometimes, my friends, we can have all the faith in the world and God still chooses not to heal. David Watson, one of the great charismatic leaders whose church, St. Michael the Belfry in York, it's, it, it's there in the shadow of York Minster, great charismatic leader, struggled with cancer at the end of his life. Some of the biggest names within the global church with acknowledged healing ministries flew across the world to pray for him. John Wimber. He died of cancer. When God says no. And that is painful. And that is puzzling. And that is the personal reality for some of you folks sitting here this morning. That you prayed and you prayed and you longed and God said no. And it hurts this morning, doesn't it? It still is a puzzle this morning, isn't it? And we read a third of the gospel where folks are getting healed like there's no tomorrow. Eh? Machine gun healing. But not for you. And not for your loved one. And it's crass ignorance that suggests it's due to a lack of faith. God forgive them, for they haven't got a clue. A few days before he died, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote a note to his wife and daughter. He was very poorly and he could no longer speak. He, he had facial movement. And he wrote this note to his wife and his, and his daughter. Don't pray for healing. Don't hold me back from glory. But he was an 81-year-old man. An 81-year-old man. He wasn't a child. But the beginning of life, like the seven-month-old child who has died to a family that are a part of this church in the last two weeks, don't hold, don't pray for healing, don't hold me back from glory. The glory was to have the child. 
to see it grow, to watch it develop. The young adult in the prime of their life who's struck down and we pray and we pray and they and they're taken. The mother with everything to live for. When God says no, it is painful. It is puzzling. And sadly it's a part of the journey of faith. That probably will be a mystery until until we get a glory. I, I'm, I'm conscious we've got communion. I'm going to leave it there. Um, I did have a few more things to say, but I'm just so, so. These healing miracles. Okay, there's a third of them. There's a lot of them. They mustn't force us into thinking that God heals. All the time, every time. They're not there for that purpose. They are there for Mark to say, look, the kingdom, the kingdom is breaking in. You read the Old Testament, there are hardly any in the entire Old Testament, there are hardly any literal accounts of healings in the Old Testament. So what we have to learn is they're there in order to support his argument, the king has come. But they're not there as pattern and practice for everyday Christian living. God does heal, but more often than not, he doesn't. And the, 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 the greatest healing, of course, is the healing from sin and death and hell. And that is wonderful, but when you've got someone who's physically dying or struggling, it's hard, to, it's hard to spiritualize and get on that plane. There are a few folks who can manage it, but normal bog-standard Christians like me, we can't really aspire to that because <laughs> it hurts us so much when folks are struggling. So I want you to know that as we look at healing in the gospel coming, okay, we're not thinking that everybody should be healed. These are illustrative. But God does heal, but often he doesn't. Let's pray. And I I just want, as we prepare for communion, and and we're not going to sing, all right? I'm just going to get Carrie to play, because time is going. So I'd like Carrie just to play, and deacons to get ready, all right? Because I'd rather we had a couple of minutes to allow those in the congregation who have known the pain of loss and of prayer answered in a way that you'd have preferred it hadn't been answered. I'd rather you had the opportunity just to have a couple of minutes to, uh, to ache, to ache before God. And to give him your pain again. And even if that's with a clenched fist, he can cope with that.
And so on the night on which he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body. Broken. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Dear Lord, it's, um, it's a privilege to come to this meal this morning. It's not always easy. It's not always joyful. But it's a symbol that you weren't immune to pain. You didn't just sit up in glory in heaven and watch people suffer. But you came and lived among us. You went through what people in this congregation are going through, have gone through, will go through. And you stand in solidarity with us, weep with us. I love the imagery of taking Peter's mother-in-law by the hand, Lord, and I pray that you would come this morning and take people by the hand, grab them in a bear hug, And Lord, heal broken hearts. We thank you that it's not just our hearts that you want to heal, but our whole lives are not just empty words, but action, purpose, and results, Lord. And as we take this bread this morning, Lord, let us all just take hold of your saving ministry, your saving work, your saving purpose, and let that be a massive spiritual bear hug for us this morning. Amen. So as we're served, we'll eat the bread and we'll remember Christ crucified for us. Would the deacon serve the church, please?
I think it's in incredible the way uh, God works and puts these services together. Because he laid on my heart these um, the beginning verses from um, Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Um, God was comforting his people who'd um, turned their back on him so often and said that I love you and I can give you um, twice as much in goodness that your sins really deserve. And that's looking forward to us because we're God's people now. And we've been talking about um, needing comfort for the times when um, people we've prayed for haven't been healed, but God gives us that comfort. So let's just pray and thank him for his amazingness. Heavenly Father, you spoke those words to your people Israel, but they can be applied to your church today. We're certainly comforted that our sins have been paid for, not as we deserve, but as our Lord Jesus dying for us on the cross. We are thankful that we do not have to worry whether we have done enough to earn your forgiveness or our place in heaven. As we drink this communion wine, remember and are hugely grateful, more than we can express in words, that Jesus took the punishment for our sins upon himself so that we can enjoy and be part of your loving family for eternity. Amen. Amen. And so in the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we'll retain the cup as we're served and then we'll drink together as a mark of our fellowship. Will the deacons serve the church, please?
the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for us. We thank you, Lord, that your mercies are new every morning and that your faithfulness is great. Comfort those who mourn. Pour your healing balm into those who ache. Give peace to those who are confused and faithfulness to each one of us as we journey with you to that place where you will wipe every tear from our eyes and there will be no more sickness or death or mourning or crying or pain because you are making everything new. Give us the faith to hold firm to that conviction even when we walk through the valley of the shadow. For Jesus' sake, amen.